Have you ever heard of pyrecrete ice made so hard that it's bulletproof? How about a giant aircraft carrier made out of ice? Hmm. Or covered operatives disguised as firemen sent to Romanian oil fields to set fire rather than putting them out? Sending amateur golfers to Germany to pull the Germans and show them Hitler was not as popular as he made them believe. Pluto, an underwater oil pipeline through the English Channel to supply Operation Overlord. All ideas that one man forged to defeat the Nazis. He was a spy, a mad genius and the ultimate nutty professor, an eccentric inventor who enjoyed Winston Churchill's trust and had real impact on the Allied war effort. So, our hero, meet Geoffrey Pike, codename Iceman. I'm Astra Deinhardt. And I'm Anna Deinhardt, and this is Spice and Ties, a series of World War II in real time. Hello, darlings. Now, today's episode is especially important to us personally. Geoffrey Pike is one of our most beloved heroes, right? When I say our, I mean also Indies, Spartacus, and Sebastian, who wrote this. Although flawed, like so many of us, his contributions to defeat Nazism were significant. He never got the credit he deserved. And this is our effort to remedy that a little bit. So don't you dare turn off until the very end. Don't you dare. You're not my darlings anymore. Okay. Geoffrey Pike firmly believed that everything was possible till proved the opposite by oneself and the matter the scheme the better the chances of success that's what he said many of his ideas especially pyrocrete have been covered in various documentaries over the years but what about the man himself in many ways he embodied both the conflicting ideals within the allied forces and the amazing innovative thinking it took to win this war Regardless of genius is genetic or acquired, it often takes experience, oftentimes traumatic, for it to bloom. Pike was born in 1893 in England to parents of Jewish Dutch background. His father, a barrister, died when Pike was little, leaving little money behind. That left him with what can only be described as a monster of a mother, who at times remarked that she would happily switch places with his deceased father. A formative trauma which would go on to haunt Pike through his life. Thirteen years old, he was forced to go to Wellington boarding school. Here conflict intensified as Pike, now an atheist, clashed with his mother's religious expectations. Despite desperate pleas, his mother forced him to wear orthodox Jewish clothing and to eat kosher food. That made him the perfect prey for the normal British boys of the school, and relentless and violent bullying ensued. Later, he would hold a speech at that very school and tell the pupils, Yet, when I was quite certain I'd be taken out and shot as a spy, I was never quite so unhappy, never so completely miserable, as I'd been here at Wellington. I'm sure that speech went down well with the teachers and staff anyway. After secondary education, he goes straight to Cambridge. And here he comes out of his cocoon, like a butterfly, reborn spreading his wings and soaring for the first time in his life. The shy, bullied boy disappears and gives place to a confident, sometimes overly confident young man willing to challenge everyone and everything. One of the things that will make Pike so special, his willingness, desire even, to challenge the impossible. So, when the First World War breaks out, he decides to become a war correspondent for a, a British newspaper. 
with no experience in journalism, a near impossible task. But Pike already has a mantra. The proper formulation of a problem leaves one more than halfway at the solution. So, Pike decides to turn things around rather than look for towns and cities where there would be an oversupply of correspondence. He decides to focus on those where there would always be a short supply. And where would that be naturally? <laughs> Berlin comes to mind. That makes sense. Oh no, that wait a minute. Sense. That Berlin, sense. that's the capital city of the enemy. That was the enemy. Indeed. British intelligence agencies believe it utterly impossible to smuggle agents into Germany. The fact that Pike only speaks very limited German should perhaps hold him back. What? Oh no. He has a solution. The US is not in the war yet, so Pike buys an American birth certificate and gets himself an American passport. And thus, a 21-year-old nobody succeeds at what intelligence thought was impossible. He gets to Berlin. It's brief success though. After just a couple of days, two German policemen pick him up at his hotel and take him into custody. It turns out that the American contact he has made who has promised to smuggle his reports out of Germany is actually working for the Germans. So, off to prison it is. There, Pike applies another of his unique features that sets him apart from us normal people, applying the scientific method of an experimentation to any problem, whatever the nature of the problem. In his case, escape from, from prison. prison. But his escape from William prison camp is deemed to be impossible, at least according to other prisoners. Well, as you know by now, the impossible does not deter Pike. He carefully ponders the problem. He finds one prisoner trustworthy enough to confide in and soon they agree. Escape it is. He begins by conducting small tests here and there in the camp. When and where the guards are paying extra attention, how would they walk? Where could they hide in the outer perimeter? What would they need? Etc. 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 Here, two more of Pike's unique traits come into play. A near obsessive focus on detail and thinking outside of the box, even for trivial things. Pike tears apart every assumption others might believe to be immutable facts questioning everything. His intense pondering of the problem of how would they walk illustrates this. Not only one, but two types of crawls come out of his project. Moving side to side like crap or sliding on his belly like a caterpillar. The two walks are aptly named the crab and the caterpillar walks, respectively. But how do you explain experimenting and exercising, crawling, sneaking and sliding around the prison yard to the ever-vigilant guards? Pike does it like this. Well, Herr Wachtmeister, these are exercises given to me by doctor, so and so, for my weak heart, which for some reason the German guard choose to believe. And soon comes once more a chance for Pike to do the impossible. And the escape begins. There's a little bit of luck involved, but mostly Pike's careful and thorough deliberation of the problem is what brings them out of the camp. They caterpillar and crept their way through the fence perimeter and then make their way slowly and cautiously through Germany, easing closer and closer to the Dutch border. N not crabbing anymore, by the way. <laughs> oh, not. But almost there, on the last stretch, resting in a bush, a soldier spots them and creeps up from behind. Pike desperately clamors for an explanation. The soldier is skeptical of the explanations and speaks in a funny German accent. What are you doing on this side of the German border? The German border? Yes, 
Germany is just over there, the soldier points to a blockhouse a few meters away. What had the soldiers just said? They're in Netherlands? <laughs> At once, the two men jump in acceleration. Pike's companion even jumps into the arms of the soldier. <laughs> Pike's genius has led them to pull off one of the only three successful escapes from Ruhrleben <laughs> during the entire war and at that, the first one. <laughs> so, in 1915, the two men return to Britain, celebrated as heroes. But to some, his daring feat seems suspicious, almost too good to be true. What if the Germans had released Pike and he was in fact a spy sent back to Britain? He ends up being put on His Majesty's Security Service watch list, the predecessor to MI5, and their suspicion of him will never really go away. Pike now focuses on a long row of money-making schemes that do not really pay off. Often because he's too enthusiastic, gives away too much of his ideas, and his purported partners and friends steal them. He marries, has a son, and is inspired to get into education, even founding a school. But as fascism rises across Europe and anti-Semitism explodes when the Nazis take control of Germany, he once again comes under the eyes of the security services. Pike comes to believe that the West is in decline, not ready to stem the tide of fascism, and that only the Soviet Union and its ideology could stop the search. While he remains a Fabian, someone who believes in the achievement of the revolution by peaceful means, he begins to associate with radical Marxism, member of the Comintern spies from the German KPD and members of other Soviet secret agencies. So, Soon to be MI5, now label him a Soviet propagandist, even a suspected Soviet spy instead of a German one. Eventually, he gets involved with lobbying for Christian institutions <clears throat> to oppose Nazi anti-Semitism more strongly and working out how to support the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. In early 1939, he sets up a private intelligence organization and sends a group of golfers to tournaments in Germany to poll Germans on the true opinions on Hitler. While visiting Frankfurt together with Tori M.P. Liu Emery, he develops the idea to use his golfer network as spies. But they and the golfer agents are called back by the Foreign Office in late August, as war seems imminent. And the very next week, war does come. And then it's 1940. Germany is steamrolling Europe and Denmark and Norway have just fallen. Many Britons feel powerless, unable to do anything about the situation. Not one Joffrey Pike. He sets himself a problem to solve. How to win the war? He's using his method to reject the impossible, formulate the right problem and think outside of the box. He concludes that Norway is the key to success. He figures that with the lowest population density in continental Europe, the German occupier, rather than being present everywhere, must only have a tight grip on the small populated areas. Vast parts of the country remain deserted. What if one could make the Germans commit more manpower and resources to patrolling this military useless empty countryside? Maybe by sending small elite units there to sabotage German operations? Hmm, mm. thinks Pike. Sounds marvelous. But there's also this. Norway, especially the areas with fewer populations than the north, is covered with a lot of snow and ice. Usually that is seen a hindrance to military operations, something to avoid. Not for Pike. He thinks to himself, there are sea, land and air forces. What if ice is more like air, an element for the longest time impossible to conquer for humans, had just proven its importance in the last war? What about an ice force adapted to mountainous, snowy and icy terrain? 
Rather than seeing ice as a disadvantage, it should be seen as an asset, something to be exploited. He comes up with a plan. The Allies need a new snowmobile, crewed by two or three men and organized in loose and independent small units carrying demolition equipment and guns. He calls it Plow Force. At first. No one takes him and his plow for seriously. From 40 to 42, he is on an odyssey, trying to get anyone he can to take his proposal seriously. No one does. Churchill's scientific advisor Frederick Lindemann goes so far as to say Pike clothes. His idea was so much garrulous, pseudo-scientific blather, that the reading of it becomes very wearisome. But by 1942, the situation in the war has changed and Pike can use Amory to give his proposal a second shot. Amory has one man in mind, Louis Francis Albert Victor Nicholas Mountbatten, cousin to the king. One of the few in the high echelons of the military apparatus yearning for new ideas and ploys. Pike began Amory to give his proposal to the man and Amory does Mountbatten. And his combined operations headquarters decide to give the unusual man a shot. The job of the department of Mountbatten, as described by Churchill, is this. All the other headquarters in this country are thinking defensively. Your job will be to think offensively, to restore the offensive spirit. It's a novum in many ways, charged with the commander raids on the mainland, incorporating all branches of the military and set to think outside of the box. On paper, if Pike fit in anywhere in the British military, it would be here. Now, Mountbatten, or Dicky is a classicist who believes in the inherent superiority of the aristocracy and its birthright. Counterbalance this with Pike, a socialist who cares little for protocol, birthright or convention. To everyone's, perhaps even their own surprise, the two get along famously well. Dickie is convinced of plow force and becomes one of its ardent supporters. He, in turn, goes to his good friend and boss, Winston Churchill, who also becomes fond of the idea. It feels right into his obsession to redeem the British failure in Norway. As a result, Pike becomes a civil servant with a salary of £1,500 per month. At that time, a huge sum, and with his support of two of his most influential men in wartime Britain. Pike now sets himself to improve and develop his vision and soon concludes that it should be an international cooperation, ideally involving Russia, the United States and Canada. And circumstances push the project forward. You see, in 1942, the Americans are anxious to open a second front against the Axis. Churchill and the British are aware that this is impossible to show some initiative and satisfy the American delegation, send to Britain with something of substance, they have Pike explain the plough project to them. The Americans are intrigued and Pike is sent to the US to inform and consult the Americans who now have the responsibility of developing the new snowmobiles and training the troops. At first, the infamous can-do attitude of the Americans pleases Pike. But there remains a problem. Generals, especially the American ones, do not like getting told what to do by a civilian, especially a disheveled, quirky-dressed one with an unruly beard. Mm -hmm. It does not help that Pike is British and Jewish. He is put on the sidelines and the project continues without his involvement. And soon the project begins to flounder and Pike is called back. Oops. But 
In the end, while his plan to use Norway to win the war does not pan out, this project will arguably be his most important contribution to the war effort. The snowmobile that is eventually created is very close to Pike's original proposal, and over 12,000 of them will be built. The FSSF, First Special Service Force, that come out of Plough Force is described as a group of individualists and outcast probably the best fighting force this continent has ever produced and probably the most bold and imaginative scheme in this war. It is used to great effect on the Aleutian Islands, France and Italy. Most famously perhaps member of the FSSF managed to break the German winter lines by capturing Monte la Defensa in 1943. It also succeeds in the confusing and terrorizing the enemy, just as Pike had envisioned, with the unit leaving death stickers on the corpses of their enemies. But Pike's largely forgotten as the inventor and never gets the credit for it. That is sad. We never hear these black devils when they come, as one German officer's diary entry will read. Furthermore, it gathers praise from Eisenhower and many other leading military figures. It is one of the world's first modern special forces units and the forefather to the modern American and Canadian special forces and the first time international military cooperation has been employed on such a scale. But what about our pike? Well, Dickie gets promoted to Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia. Good for him, but not good for Pike. He's lost his biggest supporter and MI5 is still breathing down his neck because of his allegedly communist spy status. So his career as a civil servant ends in 1944. Yet, Plow was not his only success. Together with other improvements and suggestions he made, Pike's contributions proved monumental in the successful execution of Operation Overlord, D-Day. But during his lifetime, at least, he would never hear this praise. By 1948, he is frustrated, fed up, and his health has deteriorated. He has just been swindled by yet another business partner. He feels betrayed and annoyed that his ideas are never taken to the full, always pushed back, ignored and ridiculed. So on February 21, 1948, he retreats to his room, never to reemerge. He takes an overdose of barbiturates prescribed by doctors years before to soothe and temper his mood. He begins to write his goodbyes to his ex-wife and son. My darling Sonny, I cannot help myself. I am too tired, too exhausted. And I have been swindled again by a man who has taken my ideas. I die loving you and mommy. My heart's best wishes go out to you. I cannot explain the misery of my life. There would be no purpose in the attempt to. I cannot go on. This last blow just finishes me. The thing to do is to be as detached as you can about my death. This may seem a strange thing to say. You will feel I've deserted you. It is true, but it's beyond me to endure more. Forget me as soon as possible. I'd like everything concerning me to be destroyed and to be forgotten as if I'd never lived. I've only a few minutes left. I'm now going under. I love you. I've forgotten so much I wanted to say. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go on. One second. In 2024, his novel ideas like a mobile winter force, the Pluto underwater pipeline and others that help win the war are not associated with him. Instead, he's really only remembered for the craziest of his ideas that were never made reality. 
like pycrete. Ice reinforced with sawdust to make it hard like concrete. Concrete that floats, from which Pike figured you could build landing boats, even aircraft carriers. Although that idea was really nuts, it is perhaps fitting for his true legacy. That in desperate times, even the most outlandish ideas, if executed correctly, can bring unexpected success. Without men and women like Geoffrey Pike, much of the Allied war effort would have suffered and even more people would have died in this terrible war. To see other unexpected inventions of this war, click here for a video that Indy made about things like duct tape. It is the participation of the Time Ghost Army that allows us thinking outside of the box and do crazy things like cover this war in real time. So, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or at patreon.com. Subscribe and ring that bell. And we will see you next time, darlings. Thank you.